for joining us again for the uh, afternoon sessions of our SRAP Live uh, 2024 Summit. So our second panel, as I mentioned earlier, is going to explore opportunities for working together in amplifying voices to achieve large scale food systems change. Um, I am super excited to introduce a friend of SRAP uh, and consultant, um, Jake Davis. He works as an entrepreneur, farmer, consultant, and policy advisor with a bachelor's degree in agriculture education from the University of Missouri and a master's in public administration from the Harry S. Truman School of Public Affairs. Uh, Jake has dedicated his career to building a better farm and uh, food system through market development and policy reform. Over the past decade, he has provided market and policy expertise to national NGOs like the National Audubon Society, Organization for Competitive Markets, the Berry Center, and most recently as the National Policy Director for Family Farm Action. Uh, between 2018 and 2020, he collaborated in drafting four landmark pieces of legislation to create a structural reform of federal farm policy and has advised political candidates from state house to presidential on farm and food issues. He is a policy powerhouse, and we are super excited to have him with us today on our uh, panel. He's going to be moderating the discussion. He currently farms in central Missouri, producing pasture-raised pork and vegetables. So, Jake, I will let you take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, good to see you, and good to see you all. Thanks for having me, and thanks for having me, and thanks for the excited for us to talk more in this panel about uh, the power of collaboration, quite honestly, which is the theme of, of our discussion here and how important it is in the face of um, um, such sort of daunts and, and a challenging industry that, that we're up against that has sort of aggregated a huge amount of power, which I know you're going to hear more about and probably have heard a lot about already through these panels, but, um, but you're going to hear more about in, in our keynote address in just a little while. But in the face of that um, industry power, it is critically important that we find ways to, to collaborate. And SRAP has, uh, I just wanted to, to congratulate um, and Sherry and the team at SRAP for all the collaborative work that they have done uh, to, to work on projects all the way from work, all the way from working with um, current and former contract growers all the way to um, pasture um, pork and, and poultry producers uh, to file briefs at the Supreme Court and with community members uh, to pass legislation and and with folks to uh, push back against federal reg regulation and, and and everything in between quite honestly so, um, so that's we're going to spend time talking about more of that collaboration in this panel, but um, just wanted to to highlight briefly that that SRAP is a great place for that intersection of collaboration to occur. So as we're talking about as we're talking about these, you know, it's a great opportunity to um, to to think about how we. Um, broaden the the work that we're all doing both with SRAP and all the organizations involved in the summit. So with that, I want to just start out by intro out by introducing our first um uh Starla Becker Tilling Gap. Becker Tilling Gap. <laughs> Starla Becker Tilling Gap is from um uh, Lynn County, Oregon. And a lot of us had our eyes on Oregon this past year for um, a, a, a major development related to development related to um, and public policy. Uh, but Starla had a firsthand experience of that. As a community member, she's a critical care nurse in her community, but also has deep farming roots and had a, a, her own dairy farm at, at age 15, age 15 and, and milk and, and and toted cans of milk to the local town. Um, and and also has been a, an active community advocate um, there in Oregon. So, uh, Starla, I wanted to just give you a few seconds to, before we dig into our you know conversation about the work you all have been doing in Oregon, for you to just say a few minutes more about what we should know, or maybe just a few seconds more about what we should know about your community in, in Oregon and um, your background there. Thank you. Our community is small. It's we're in the Willamette Valley. It's really green. We have a lot of clean water. 
a lot of farmers, a lot of grass seed farmers, dairies, a lot of dairies that are organic, let their cows graze. They do a really good job at that. Um, we're really getting into hazelnuts too as well. So definitely a lot of ag here and a lot of timber. Yeah. And that's kind of where we started out. Many of us, our, our ancestors came over in the covered wagons and we're still here. Not me, but most of us. And then, you know, we love it. We love it here. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, as I mentioned, you, you know, you had a, a, a real um, front row seat for the the work that was done, the work that was done. And many of us, including myself, uh, have admired the work that you all did from afar and have been really appreciative of the uh, the organizing and, quite honestly, the collaborative effort that existed in Oregon that, that started around a concept of putting a moratorium on on factory farms and and ultimately resulted in and ultimately resulted in being at the state level in a, in a long time uh, and SB eighty five and so maybe before we talk about sort of the legislation and what resulted i'd love for you to say more about your the sort of the the sort of the the heard why folks came together and then what you saw and, and how folks were coming together to, to to sort of fight this fight both in your local community and at the state house yeah yeah i'd love to tell you so i prepared a lot of things one uh, about organizing and i wanted to say that yesterday those gals sharing about the biogas, they shared the perfect recipe, how to organize and mobilize. I'm not going to repeat that because it was so perfect. It's what we did. And I was just thinking also last night how, you know, some people have lifelong goals. They're going to write a book, build a house, the stuff they've planned. And when I was trying to put four years of what we did into five minutes, it was kind of hard. There's so much that went on. And I realized that when we stood up and we fought to keep them away from our water in our communities, we were fighting for our lives and their lives. And that sort of was, you could almost call that a lifetime goal. And I'm thankful for everybody else in this group that's trying so hard to keep communities livable, waters clean and protect our small farmers. Uh, we did realize there was a plan in place. It probably been in place a lot longer than we knew when one of the gals who worked at a local feed store um, saw a Foster Farms landman tag on somebody and asked him about it. And he's talking about, well, we've got plans for these five places and they're going to, some of them will have 60, 16, 60 by 600 foot barns and uh, we'll, we'll be raising probably 6 million chickens a year there. And we want to keep this in a 12 mile radius in this wet, heavily populated Willamette Valley. And she learned one of those places was actually near her road. And she he's saying, well, we're going to keep the, the wealthy people's house. We're going to put a buffer up so they won't really notice us. And uh, we'll, And then she says, well, what about that little red house on the corner? And he goes, oh, that's just two people live there. They don't have enough money to do anything about us. She's an SRAP member now. Also, we were noticing, um, you know, that whole thing about a central place to communicate. So when a website was established post haste, after we scrambled, we were all of us, once once the earth movers moved into the other neighbors' places, they believed it. It was hard to believe this was true, right? We were a scramble to find who can help us. That's, where do you look? We went online and we actually found the former director of SRAP who knew how to organize this. And she we mobilized really quickly, thank goodness, with that. I was going to say too, this coming to me, you know, listening to everybody talk, how important this centralized data is, ways to share, kind of like your brain trust. There's so much information out there and it's so hard to find it when you're scrambling. Um, I, I just like to encourage us to get a, it would be very cool to have a one central place for a way to contact all these people that have been on here today. Now we had meetings, we had community meetings. One of our information systems, I called it, she had a yard sign on her pickup. And I just remember one day I saw her driving down the freeway and the yard sign was so well done that I could read the website, where to go to find out information about this. She was like one of our mobile notification systems. We talked to everybody we could, like I said, informational meetings, dead of winter, COVID, mass, but we just would not shut up. 
then when it came time to testimony, we're trying to facilitate our community members. Many, some of the people here, they don't even have internet. Uh, the internet doesn't work that well, or they don't even use computers. They're old farmers. I mean, they're not old, but you know, they're just old school. And we help those people. We help people testify that didn't have the means to because all of this was happening online. We pulled them in and like set up a computer for them, encouraged them, stood there with them while they testified. We transcribed letters for people. I think sometimes the people, the officials need to hear from the most, the voices that need to be heard the most, the farmers, those people who are really living the life, they're shy. They don't want to speak up against other farmers. They they feel really bad about that, but their voices are so important. And we really try to facilitate that. And then finally, when it came time to testify, uh, you can Google the OLIS site SB-85 and see there were over 800 testimonies. And there were mistakes made on those testimonies. And one of our community, one of our team members and IT tech from the government fix those mistakes because things, again, are confusing and they're really hard to get to. So that was some of the ways that we helped get people, you know, uh, hitched up there with getting their voices heard. And I think that's so important. Another thing is we argued with science. You know, sometimes you can get really worked up and you're you're so angry, it's hard to keep sense of what, what you're doing. And we used proof. We used links in our letters to show them what our proof was. The school administrator actually got Oregon Health Authority to do a lit review on the health uh, for children because one was placed, gonna be placed right next to a school and they gave us credibility. I just wanted to leave a little bit, be careful what you argue. Um, I've seen people lose their fights by bringing hot political topics in. Immigration is really touchy and scary like we heard earlier, it's so scary for the workers. And uh, things like animal rights, that just about lost us at the end because when that came in, all of a sudden they thought that's what we were after. And we've always just been ag people fighting to keep our ag as it is and keep our waters clean. Holding decorum is extremely vital. It's hard to do if you're the kind of feisty person that's going to stand up and fight for your community. You're also the person that's probably going to be wanting to, you know, shake if you people make them really listen to you. And it was so hard to, to continue to keep a decorum and you need to be respectful to all the officials you're dealing with. I think that's very important. Kendra uh, kept telling us, she said, remember, this is a sprint, it's a marathon. And I'd like to add, it's like a chess game and sometimes a wing and a prayer. And I say, we've got a right to farm, but we sure don't have a right to harm. And thanks, thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. I uh, think and thanks for sort of telling us a little bit about the the experience you had. I'd love to to have you follow up a little bit with just you know this was to, to your point such a long and uh, and sometimes a, a fast paced and sometimes a slow paced fight and uh, and a persistent fight. Um, but ultimately, the work you all did uh, and, and lots of folks um, did in in Oregon resulted in SB 85, B 85 passing. Could more about sort of what SB 85 does? And in particular, I want to hear about what your community recently uh, was enabled to do because of the new law. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I always say, you know, if you've got a problem and a complaint, you need to come with a solve. You just can't say something's wrong without finding a way to fix it. And I must say here at this point too, we have the benefit of people helping us with research. I'd like to call out again, Kendra did yesterday, Jean Argenberger. She, she was so helpful. I've got boxes and boxes of research and I researched then uh, the, the, um, the setbacks. And so that's what SB 85 gave us. It, it closed a loophole with water and then it also gave us the counties the power to have a setback. And we went to the county. I had researched both with like my relatives, they're all farmers in other states. Like, what do you think is setbacks? What's fair? What do you think? It, Cause we only had like 50 feet. Somebody was putting a litter shed 50 feet from a property line. And that's just not good. And so we had researched with 
you know, actual people. And then I went on and did a search across the states trying to find setbacks for any of the states. Some states don't even have setbacks, by the way. This one I called Washington, I think it was, and they couldn't figure out what their setback was, but I got a good paper about uh, pig and cow manure out of them. So, you know, sometimes it's sharing the information again. Again. Well, we did. We went to the county, we went to the commissioners and we talked to them and we shared our research on that. I gave them, you know, what we printed out with links and proof. And there were two meetings again, where we again gave testimony, sometimes last minute, sometimes with husbands having open heart surgery the last next day. But we managed to get in there and give our testimony. And in the give end, testimony, even though our commissioners end. are totally, they're totally pro-ag, and they support our ag and timber industry, they were able themselves to set our setback. And it, it, it's a wonderful thing, although we're going to continue to monitor as long as we can. Yeah, yeah. great. And, and what is the sort of what is the current result or maybe the current state of um, Foster Farms work there in, in Oregon because of that? Oh, I think they're pretty discouraged. Two of the places, two of the three actual places that we're, got, we're working on permits are for sale. The third one just today, it's been out in the news that the ODA and DEQ pulled the permit and are reconsidering because their placement was so on such wet ground. That was one of our big fights. And again, we didn't have the benefit of maps. We're scotch taping photographs together. We're getting a few little drone shots. We're showing flood shots. I paid a community college to, or a college to give me their aerial shots from 1935, showing water movement. That's kind of how unsophisticated we are. Um, but our argument was it's too wet. And right now uh, the, the state has pulled the permit and is going to give six months consideration. So we're just kind of still hanging in on that one. So yeah. Great. Well, thanks for telling us some of your story. And I want to circle back around to you in a little bit, but I want to get the rest of our panel introduced. And we'll, uh, we'll and, and just as a reminder to folks, we're going to save a little bit of time towards the end of the conversation. So conversation. So if you have, uh, please drop them into the chat and we'll, we'll try to get back to those in, in a few minutes. But I want to introduce um, our next uh, panelist, Emily Miller, who is a staff attorney for Food and Water Watch. Uh, she focuses her work on the air and water pollution associated with factory farms, and Emily holds a JD from the University JD from the University of Berkeley, and and is currently located or headquartered in um, Colorado. Emily, I want to just bring you in and have you share a few seconds about for folks that are listening who might not be familiar with Food and Water Watch. Maybe if you can tell us just a little bit, and that's just a little bit the the sort of thumbnail she does. Sure, um, and thanks for having me. Um, so Food and Water Watch is a national environmental advocacy organization, um, and we fight on three main fronts, uh, on food, on climate and energy, and on clean and safe water. Uh, and our mission really is to mobilize regular people to fight for um, solutions to some of our most pressing food, water, and climate issues, and really take on some of those big, um, powerful economic interests uh, that are polluting our planet and our communities. Um, yeah. And I particularly work on our campaign to ban factory farms. Great. Thank you for being here. And um, speaking of collaboration, which is certainly the theme of our panel here today, I know that Food and Water Watch was active in um, where where possible in the work in Oregon, and so thanks for the efforts that you put in on um, Starla's work there. But I want to turn to our conversation a little bit towards federal uh, policy, and particularly um, uh, policy around EPA's regulation or the Environmental Protection Agency's regulations of of uh, factory farms. We heard of some factory farms. We heard of some conversation and, and that sort of thing that as Starlo was chatting, I wonder if you could tell us more about the work that you're doing to petition for updating of the, the rulemaking and and um, of the regulatory sort of regulatory sort of framework that exists farms and, and sort of how those processes work. Yeah, definitely. Um, so our work on this front 
uh, has really been a case study in EPA's refusal to treat factory farms like every other industrial water polluter. Um, for many decades, EPA has repeatedly given the industry a free pass to pollute uh, through really weak and ineffective clean water regulation. Um, and in beginning in 2017, Food and Water Watch uh, and a coalition of 32 environmental and environmental justice groups set out to change that by filing a petition for rulemaking, urging EPA to update and strengthen its clean water program for factory farms. Uh, and in so doing to finally hold the industry accountable for its water pollution. Um, and before I dive into the specifics of the petition and EPA's response uh, and our current ensuing lawsuit, uh, I just wanted to step back and give a brief overview of um, some of the key issues with factory farm water pollution and EPA's lax regulation of it. Um, so as I'm sure many of you know, industrial scale factory farms that can find thousands or millions of animals at a time, they generate vast quantities of waste uh, containing a lot of dangerous pollutants like nutrients, pathogens, pharmaceuticals, heavy metals. Um, and this waste ends up getting hyper concentrated in certain communities and watersheds where it creates huge problems. Um, so these operations essentially are operating like sewerless cities, um, and they dump millions of gallons of untreated waste onto fields uh, where it leaches into soils and groundwater and also runs off into nearby waterways. So the massive growth of this industry over the past few decades has led to widespread water pollution. Um, and it's contaminated thousands upon thousands of miles of waterways, drinking water sources, recreational waters, um, with some really devastating impacts uh, environmentally and health-wise for communities and ecosystems that rely on those resources. So the Clean Water Act is our nation's federal um, premier water pollution control law, and it's supposed to rain in pollution from industrial polluters like factory farms through a permit system that imposes strict requirements on facilities to prevent and control their discharge of waste to waterways. Um, but for the past 50 years, as long as the law has been around, EPA has really shirked its Clean Water Act obligations with respect to factory farms through weak and completely ineffective regulation. Um, so for instance, because of gaping loopholes in EPA's rules, there are thousands of operations that discharge pollution to waterways without required permits. So by EPA's own estimate, they're 75% of CAFOs discharge pollution and therefore need a clean water permit. However, less than 30% of these CAFOs actually have them. So if you do out the math, that means that there are almost 10,000 factory farms across the country that are operating illegally and discharging pollution completely unchecked. So lack of permitting is one really big problem. The other is that for the permits that do exist, they do a very poor job of actually controlling pollution. So for instance, pollution standards that govern land application are focused on maximizing crop yields rather than on protecting water quality. Um, and the permitting regulations don't even address numerous pollutants of concern in CAFO waste streams like antibiotics and heavy metals. They just ignore them completely. Uh, so nevertheless, EPA has kind of sat back and not done anything to address these really obvious problems uh, for many, many years. So it's against that backdrop that our coalition filed a petition for rulemaking in March of 2017, calling on the agency to fix its broken program. And we laid out kind of a roadmap for reform uh, and made a series of recommendations to ensure that one, all discharging CAFOs would be subject to permits, and two, that those permits would actually be effective at controlling water pollution. So recommendations included things like establishing presumptions that large CAFOs discharge and need to be permitted, um, closing regulatory loopholes like the agricultural stormwater exemption that have allowed operators to evade permitting altogether, uh, and tightening up pollution uh, standards and monitoring requirements contained within permits. 
Uh, it took EPA six and a half years to answer our petition. And we actually had to sue them to force the agency to issue their response, which they did in August of 2023. And they denied our petition <laughs> in full. Um, they instead committed to doing two things. One, they'll be conducting a detailed study of CAFO water pollution to determine whether the agency should in fact strengthen CAFO pollution standards that get written into permits. And two, EPA is forming an advisory committee made up of interested stakeholders like industry, public health, community advocates to further evaluate the problem and provide recommendations to the agencies. So while this is these commitments are not nothing, our coalition ultimately determined that the proposed committee and study process is not enough. Um, and it can't take the place of actual updated regulations. Uh, for one, EPA has a lot of information in front of it already that's more than enough for it to act now. And the proposed process is going to take years to complete. Um, and its result will be non-binding recommendations that EPA is under no obligation to actually act on. So we're not settling for this deferred action approach. Um, we're gonna be fighting now on multiple fronts. Uh, we're engaging in the detailed study process and the committee process, but at the same time, Food and Water Watch and 12 of our co-petitioners um, have filed a lawsuit in federal court against EPA, challenging its refusal to strengthen its CAFO clean water rules. Um, and we're arguing that EPA's refusal to fix its broken CAFO program through a rulemaking is unlawful because it ignores a mountain of evidence supporting the need for action and it fails to uphold its Clean Water Act obligations to effectively regulate the industry's pollution. Um, so Ali will leave it there, but just bringing it back to collaboration, the theme of the panel, I just wanna emphasize that this has been a really uh, a team effort for many, many years. It's involved lawyers, frontline community members, national groups, state-based orgs that kind of represent some of the biggest CAFO country areas uh, and community-based organizations um, that are fighting on the ground. So we're making headway together. The fight for kind of changing the national landscape of CAFO water pollution control is far from over, but we're in it for the long haul. But we're in it for the long haul. Great, thank you, Emily. And just to uh, you know, that is a um, I know it's been such a long fight for Food and Water Watch and the the coalition involved. Um, for those of us who are maybe not attorneys and attorneys and aren't going to engage in full uh, suing of, of uh, EPA. What are the things that um, community members, other organizations can do to help your efforts and the, 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 both the group of attorneys are involved and um, the organization sort of headlining the, the litigation? Yeah, uh, well, we've already gotten like a really amazing groundswell of support from uh, scientists and environmental justice groups uh, and family farm organizations, SRAP included, uh, who filed friend of the court briefs uh, in support of our case, uh, which was great. And while we're hoping our lawsuit can drive change on a faster timeline, I'd say it's also really important for sustainable agriculture and environmental movement allies and community members to engage in the public process that EPA has established for evaluating the CAFO program. Um, because meaningful participation in the detailed study and the committee work will help ensure that they're not just empty promises on the agency's part, and they're not things that can just be railroaded by industry actors um, who will surely be doing everything in their power to oppose stronger regulations. In fact, all of the big industry groups have already intervened into our case to oppose us. Um, so yeah, taking part in the detailed study, submitting information, community water quality data to EPA, anything that helps our case um, would be really helpful. And then once that committee also gets off the ground, participating in that process as well. 
Great. Thank you. Um, and like like I mentioned, we're going to be back around with some questions and a couple around with some questions in a couple of minutes. Folks, don't hesitate to put questions for Emily into our chat and we'll get back to, to those as soon as we can. I want to round out our panel here by introducing um, Craig Watts, who leads the Contract Grower Transition Program, Transition Program at ESRA and has also been featured um, in places like uh, this week tonight with John Oliver and uh, many documentaries and quoted in a huge number of uh, major press publications talking about the harms of the sort of corporate integrators and and mega meat packers that that control this industry. And so, Craig, I wanted to give you just maybe uh, 30, 45 seconds to tell folks why you might be the the most famous former contract grower um, that I know. Oh, I was the only one dumb enough to say anything. Dumb enough to say okay. anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I I can't really explain it, Jake. It was just, uh, it was, it was just a, 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 the culmination of a lot of little things um, that was like the ag gag stuff was happening. I mean, we were, we had just come off a very huge disappointment with the gypsum rule back in 2010, kind of getting, no support from the administration and i had an opportunity to um work with the it was actually an animal welfare organization compassion and world farming um because i, I figured out like i had done some stuff in print before and, and the integrators never said a word about that but i saw food inc and i saw the impact that carol morrison's piece had in it and then just too much time had lapsed and i said the, the video that the, the folks need to see what's going on inside these houses so it was just uh, uh it was like lightning in a bottle dude uh, that's all i can tell you it was uh, it was the right place the right person at the right time and a five minute youtube hit the new york times hit the reddit board people saw what was actually going on inside these uh facilities and it upset them and that was the that was the plan uh they needed to know uh you know what things really were not the red barn and the white picket fence and the nice uh, Norman Rockwell, Mama and Pop Farmer, that you see on these labels because it looks nothing like that on the ground. Nothing so, like that. and and, yeah. and, me, and me, they just picked it up and, and and away we went. Yeah, well, thanks for being that person willing to say something, Craig. And uh, Craig's being modest. He was the 2015 uh, Whistleblower of the Year or of the Year and hence won the um, uh, Farm Aid Spirit Award and and. Uh, a, a number of great things and and excited to have him here on this panel but in particular uh you know craig just mentioned this this idea of the the gypso rules and so some may be uh unfamiliar with this law that we have a hundred year old law called the packers and stockyards called the packers and stockyards act create a level playing field between uh, meat packers or or what sometimes we'll refer to as integrators um and for, you know fa independent farmers and and contract folks who are under contract with contract with them and, and um, a very predatory system because much like Emily was just referring to the uh the EPA regulations uh, not being enforced and and not um, doing what is in law also the US Department of Agriculture uh, has uh, for a bunch of reasons, which we could we could spend hours on, including uh, federal courts watering down the Packers and Stockyards uh, uh, legal strength. Uh, we had this call for a new set of rules around the the Packers and Stockyards um, law many years ago in 2008, and and Craig was already active in the movement um, in in one way or another at, at that point, and. And that process took a very long time. And so, Craig, I wanted you to just say a little bit more about um, the sort of long road to getting new uh, rules for, for under the Packers and Stockyards Act and sort of what has happened over the last um, year or two uh, to to sort of uh, to to sort of change to uh, that level playing field that, that and, and trying to hold meat packers accountable for their sort of uh, irresponsible actions here. Sure. Uh, you know, it really goes back, and, I, and I, I think I've got the date right. I think it was actually 1985 when a, a lady named Mary Klaus, who was, a, a, I think she was a breeder grower here in North Carolina, stepped in to the Rural Advancement Foundation International's office in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, and just explained to them what was happening with, with the contract poultry farmers. 
Um, and we were talking about collaborations and that's, that's like the first group that like, took contract farmers in that we could collaborate with. It wasn't an unlikely ally because Raffi was still doing, it was already doing stuff with farmers, just not specifically to contract farmers. Now, 1985 was several years before I got into the business. And um, so, so I got into the business in, in 1992 and I had a little honeymoon phase where everything was okay. And then it got very evident that I was no longer con in control of my own farm. And um, I had really made a mistake. Uh, so we started forming uh, organizations and this is before uh, broadband internet and social media and all that stuff. I and mean, we did it old school, man. We, we went to uh, people's houses, we sat around kitchen tables and we, and we got folks signed up and we had quite some quite strong organizations that I know in North Carolina, we had one, the Delmarva had one, Alabama had one, Virginia, the Virginias had one. And what was happening was the companies were starting to ride by where the folks were meeting and they were taking pictures of the people's cars in the parking lots. And that if say they met on a Friday or Saturday or Monday morning, they were calling these people in one at the time said, Hey man, if you don't want to grow chickens for us anymore, you don't have to. So that pretty much killed the contract girl organizations you know, just trying to do it by themselves. So we realized very quickly that, that, that the farmers couldn't do it alone. So that, that was, uh, that was kind of, uh, I, I, I just, I just, it was just bothered me to no end that they had that much control over somebody's life. Right. And so, uh, we, we, we started working with the Raffi and, and a couple of the folks got to go up to, to the Hill and testify before the Senate Act Committee and the, House Ag Committee, and they were both people I knew, both worked with both of them, both fine folks. Um, they went and did that, and what they got for that testimony was one got back to North Carolina. She got her contract pulled immediately and and had no no no, in, no more income coming in from her farm. The other gentleman uh, was a guy, he was a little south of me. I, I won't get no uh, specifics about it, but uh, he got back, he got his contract pulled, and he wound up uh, hanging himself in his, in his poultry houses. So that was kind of a big wake up call that, you know, this, this, this is, this is BS that this can't happen. So, um, really got involved with Raffi a good bit and, 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 and pushing for these gypsum rules. Finally, a few more farmers are starting to starting to speak out. So we, we had a little committee and, um, and then, then really started forming the unlikely allies. I mean, the, the, the um, Emily Mitch, Emily mentioned a while ago that, that, uh, Food and Water Watch was a national environmental organization. Well, after Raffi, the first organization I worked with was Food and Water Watch. That that just you know, factory farmer and an environmental organization should be happening. But that those those conversations had to happen, and I think that made a strong alliance because there's a hub and a spoke here, right? The hub, the the hub of the problem is the industry and the lack of respect for the farmers. They're not treated as. Uh, as, as relative as integral as they are to the business, they are treated as an expendable resource, much like a hammer or a screwdriver that you can throw away. So the more I could get that story in front of other organizations, then the formation of CCAR, um, and that's nine, I think nine nonprofits now that, that we work with, and I work with other organizations, even the one I work uh, that I'm employed with now. Uh, so that's been a, uh, like I said, the, the collaboration has, has been the key. Um, what happened in 2008 was, uh, 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 well, the, in 2008, the Farm Bill, the Congress directed the USDA to write some rules to address some of these problems that we would brought up over the years. And Obama came in in 09, I think, and it was about 2010 before they actually published those rules. And they were pretty good. I mean, they were basically what we had written and sent up to the USDA to do. But then the industry got involved with it and they got this comics period extended. The landscape in D.C. changed. Um and so the support for it just kind of went away. I mean, we had the guy with the pretty much hand picked that we wanted to head up Gypsy Dudley Butler, and uh, he just got frustrated and he just he just threw his hands up and, and walked away. So that was kind of disappointing. But some of us just kept fighting, and um, and 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 it was. And it would, it would kind of keep coming up, and then it would kind of get. And then the Congress would do this. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, Jake? What they would. Uh, uh, they would defund. Yeah, they would put riders on the appropriations bill where the USDA, even if the rules are there, they weren't going to fund them to complete them. So that, that went on for years and years and years. But now we finally got an administration. Um, God bless them. Uh, I, 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 these issues are now being talked about from the pulpit of the president of the United States. We didn't see that. Even with Obama, we didn't see that. Biden has done a much better job. Uh, it seems like we have the right 
uh, folks in the right places right now. We've got two really good rules, strong rules coming out, the transparency and uh, poultry growing arrangements where they have to disclose issues that we never knew about before because when you raise birds for a, a, a poultry integrator, you don't own the birds. The, the integrator supplies you the birds so, and the feed. So what you wind up with is all inputs are not equal. But yet farmers are competing in this Machiavellian Thunderdome 10 men enter or five men leave tournament system where they have to compete with one another on inputs that are not are not the same. It's uh it's it's not an evaluation of a farmer's management, the money he makes. It's like a rigged lottery, I think as Bob uh Taylor accurately put it. So um and then we have the market integrity rule and that deals with discrimination and uh deceptive practices, which is cool. And then there there's two more on the horizon and correct me if I'm wrong, Jake. One of them's the uh they're gonna really look into this poultry tournament system. Um, and then the second thing is um, they're going to look at this impossible standard that the courts have held up that's called harm to competition, meaning for me to bring a case under the Packers and Stockyards Act, the gypsum stuff. I have to prove that what they did to me harmed competition across the entire country, meaning if they didn't, if they somehow hoodooed me, it had to affect the price of chicken on the shelf somewhere in California. It's an impossible standard. It's ridiculous. And it, and we really that, that's the one I think is important, Jake. That, that when we get if we could get that solved and get that regulation in place, I think uh, I think a lot of these other rules that have passed are just they're just building blocks to to having good cases, and then that way the the USDA can actually do their job. Yeah, Craig, very good, and thank you for for all the work that and and that was a great recap of sort of the history. Um, I wonder if maybe uh, you might just say, because I think a lot of us often hear, because I think a lot of us often hear about rules and regulations and litigation and th those things that are, seem sort of beyond a, a lot of us. I wonder if you might just highlight a couple of the the, the folks, individuals or organizations that are sort of nations that are sort of uh, participators or, or uh, people who made sort of waves in uh, this fight for for better, um, you know, Packers and Stockyards rules over over the years and, and just to highlight where they came from and why their voices mattered. Well, I mean, um, you know, it's certainly the Rural Advancement Foundation International here in Pittsburgh. I, I, like I said, that, that was the first group I started working with. They were um, they, man, they just held my hand. I mean, they, they taught me how to do media and they taught me you know, how to do a hill visit. They used to have to kick me under the table every once in a while because <laughs> I wasn't the most polished fella in the world that went to the hill. But anyway, um, I, there, there was, uh, golly, I mean, Food and Water Watch were great. Patty LaVera and, and Patrick Woodall, um, thought the world of them. Um, National Farmers Union had, had met with them a little bit. Uh, gosh, NSAC. Uh, the National Sustainable Agricultural Coalition was very instrumental, and and the whole CCAR movement, those nine nonprofits that that are that are part of CCAR were great. And I, and I have to I have to just give a shout out to Steve Etka, who's our quasi lobbyist in in DC, who fights for us, and he he knows the ins and outs of the hills, and, and uh, he really could go to the dark side and make probably ten times more money than he's making now. But he's he's been a true champion for our issues for as long as I've been involved with 20 years at least. So, uh, you know, props to him. 2014, um, the, the, when the expose had, had, had not come out in the fall of 2014, I got a call from Scott Marlowe from Raffi. He said, you want to meet Willie Nelson? I said, yeah, right. Okay, sure. And who doesn't want to meet Willie Nelson, right? So sure enough, next thing I knew, I was on Willie Nelson's bus and uh, they were inviting uh, myself and KW, who was a former contract poultry grower, to do the press conference at Farm Aid at 2014 that year, we got to sit up on the stage with the board members, and uh, and that was just like I, I, I knew we had arrived at that point. That was like the biggest stage ever, and then right on the heels of that was the expose. So we we had some good 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 momentum. So oh gosh, the Waterkeeper Alliance. I mean, they, those folks have been uh, SRAP. Uh, there's just too many. I, I I'll leave somebody out, and I don't want to make anybody mad. Yeah, no, it's great. I just wanted you to. I was wanted you to. That was very helpful because I it's where we um, we often and and this sort of leads me to my next question for all of you, which is uh, I want to just take a, a second and get each of you to sort of react to. You know, we we often don't know what we don't know, and we need you know both people who have 
different sets of professional experience, professional experience um, from different areas. So if, if we work in the environmental space, sometimes we need to talk more to, to, to farmers or health professionals or, or and, and vice versa. Um, what can each of you, if you just had to distill sort of one piece of advice about um, trying to build sort of coalitions of, of unlikely allies, what have you learned through all these sort of layers of, of work about how to best go about that or maybe even how to just get started uh, doing that work if, if, if you've, you've had that experience? And maybe we'll start with uh, Emily. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think even for groups or people that have kind of different main focuses and interests, there's always a through line um, that we can all connect with. Um, so whether you you are an environmental organization primarily or a farm organization primarily, um, we can agree on the big corporate players that are responsible for both environmental pollution and, you know, exploiting the, the farmer are, we need to focus our efforts on, on them, right? So I think it's really just about distilling what our common interests are and focusing on those things together. Yeah, great. Starla, what do you, what is, what's your thoughts? One thing, knowing what you're fighting, right? What your goal is, and you got to know somebody that knows somebody and that leads to other stuff. Uh, because we did a frantic online search and we tapped into Kendra, we were able to make those connections with everybody else. And I don't even know who all was helping us. Many were totally grateful. And that's why I think we need a, one spot, a landing page that can help direct people like us right away to all of this brain trust. I feel that very strongly. Thanks. Yeah, great. Craig, go ahead. I love the landing page idea. Um, I was sitting in a meeting in Durham, North Carolina, and it was Durham, me. North Carolina, and it was me. A couple of more factory farmers, or excuse me, farmers with the head factory farms. Um, and there was some water keeper folks, and there were some students there who were sick of the big companies like Cisco controlling all their food on campus. And then there was some workers uh, from the plants. And so as we go around that room and we're all doing our little spiel, I'm sitting there thinking we're telling we're all telling the same story. So I, I, so, think, I, I think Emily hit it right on. I mean, you, got, you identified the enemy. I mean, Food and Water Watch has never lied or stole from me. The EPA has never lied or stole from me. That's right. But the company that I was contracted with definitely did. So to find the enemy and don't be scared to have that conversation, you'd be surprised, you know, it, 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 to how, how, how it's not really that uncomfortable once you define the enemy and you find that common ground. Because 98% of the stuff we're telling, we're, we're telling the same story. We will fight over that other 2% 10 years down the road, but we've got other stuff to worry about right now. Yeah, great. And just a reminder, folks, we're, I do want to turn to audience questions um, in, in just a moment. I have at least one more here, but but obviously, um, as you're thinking about questions, feel free to, to drop them in and we're going to turn to those in, in just a couple of minutes. So uh, one of the things that, and, and Craig, you couldn't have teed me up better with that last response is that last response is, um, sometimes um, about the, you know, the industry and, you know, that, that sort of thing in, in sort of very broad terms um, and, and maybe not ever so far as defining quote unquote the enemy. Uh, but but I would love for the the three of you to sort of think about and, and share with us sort of how you guys define um what it is we're up against what the forces you know who who are and, and what are the forces that we're up against um in this in this fight to 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 bring about change bring about change and you were willing to say the enemy maybe i'll start with you and and work and work back with the to, to the others um so you, your question is yeah who who's the enemy in your mind craig since you just described it described it <laughs> Uh, well, there was a signature on a contract right above mine, and that's who my enemy was. Right? It was it was real easy for me to define, but uh, it, it's 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 uh, 
it's it's any 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 the, the 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 entire system. There's just so much systematic problems in it. I mean, you've got you, you've got the environmental issues, you've got the animal issues, you've got farmer issues, you've got communities getting torn apart at the seams. I mean, who who's doing all this? I mean, it's not uh, like I said, it's not not the agencies. It's uh, it, it's just a handful of companies, and 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 the food supply chain is so concentrated in the last few decades. Not only are you fighting these multi-billion dollar international corporations but then they also swing a very big stick politically whether it's locally whether it's statewide or what's on the federal level so you're fighting a lot of dollars you're fighting a lot of political influence and to be quite honest with you uh if you if you remember back and uh, there's people on this these panels that are way smarter than i am but i did read the wealth of nations and and adam smith warned against the monopoly monopsony kind of situations as right behind political influence comes corruption and I think there's a, enough evidence with some court cases that are out there now uh, that uh, really point to, you know, the, 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 the industry has done a lot to help us expose itself. And I appreciate that. Appreciate it. Yeah, great. And Starla, in your community, you know, how did you all think about um, the, the opposition? If, you may not want to use the word enemy, but how, how did you sort of think about the opposition and who they were and, and what kind of things you were up against? Well, it was hard. We're not used to, we don't, we hardly knew anything. I didn't even know what integrator meant when, when all this started. And and you just kind of think it's the grower had this idea to do this. And that's not fair. The grower's just a guy trying to make a living, maybe doing what's been family tradition. And so he's not even the bad guy. And I feel like a lot of hate got focused on them when really we're fighting not only integrator, but this huge, huge, huge corporations that are based on so much money. Some states are different than others. I noticed like a state like Oklahoma, um, just, or like for instance, Nebraska, whose governor owns CAFOs and in Oklahoma who there's so much wealth and oil and influence in government that I think each state is a little bit different, but in the end, it's the main companies. They're kind of trying to make a living, but maybe, you know, power and money corrupts. I, I wish I knew how to solve all this stuff, but it's a hard one. No, that's great. No, that's great. That's that's very and and Emily, you know, your thought about sort of when you all are um trying to sort of get our our government, what is supposed to be our government, to uh, to to sort of be responsive and things like your petition is denied and 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 so on. Sort of how do you all think about sort of um th that opposition and their power in the system? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Starla and Craig really nailed it, that there are a few very powerful, very wealthy corporate monopolies that are pulling the strings, um, that are dictating the contract terms, that are prescribing the environmental management practices that are followed, that are lining the pockets of people to gain political influence in agencies and how they regulate them um, and legislatures and how they legislate um, around these issues. So yes, while a lot of our work is focused on improving the regulation and while that might seem like we're targeting the government as the enemy, that's, that's not the case. We are trying to prod the government to do its job and hold the true polluters and people responsible accountable for their actions. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, let's turn to some. Well, um, let's turn to some uh, nations accumulating. So, Mark, do you want to um, just help us sort of um, elevate a few of those audience questions, and and I'll try to guide the conversation further, or or, or jump in where useful as well as we're going through this. No problem. Can you hear me, everybody? Um, can you hear me, everybody? Okay, wonderful. So, first question. We have a couple of questions here. They're all sort of related. Can any of the panelists speak to the KFO expansion trends in different regions? Are they expanding into new regions or augmenting existing markets? How can we anticipate where they will pop up next? And that might be best for maybe Emily. You want to to just start with that. Give to just start with that, given that you all have perspective. Sure. Um, yeah. So I think the the answer is yes <laughs> to both of those things. I think the industry is both consolidating in particular regions. Um, and I can I can pop it in the chat, but EPA posts their 
running count of how many CAFOs are in each state, uh, which they themselves admit is not like a full accounting of it. They don't have the full understanding of, of CAFOs nationwide, but there are a couple states where there is a huge CAFO presence. For instance, Iowa has over 4,000 CAFOs, primarily hog um, operations. North Carolina is a really big state for hog and, and um, poultry operations. California is huge for dairy. So yeah, there are definitely certain regions where we know there is a lot of consolidation of the industry. Um, and you can see, you can look back at EPA's kind of historical accounting and see how those trends have changed. Um, and states that are are receiving kind of new influxes um, of those facilities. And, and Craig, you might just describe a little bit about the sort of changing landscape, particularly in poultry around plants closing and new plants opening, plants closing. Yeah, it's, it's like this this multi-billion dollar shell game, right? Um, Tyson, uh, the, the, the way vertical integration works is there's always built-in excess capacity, meaning that the integrators always have more poultry house, speaking about poultry specifically, always have more chicken houses than they need for two reasons. One, they can make an example of a farmer very quickly. It's not a blip on the radar. Number two, if they get an unexpected contract, all of a sudden they can feel that, right? So so they built, Tyson built the first new processing plant they built in 20 years, probably in Humboldt, Tennessee. And it's huge. It's like a $400 million deal. And so that gave them like way more excess capacity than they needed. So these smaller maybe less efficient plants they're just they're just shutting them down one by one because they have that excess capacity with that brand new shiny plant in Humboldt Tennessee and these brand new poultry houses in Humboldt Tennessee and surrounding counties to uh to, to pick up the slack so it's been a it, it, it's and, and the farms Jake used to it was like a farm a regular farmer and he would build two houses or maybe four houses and when going about his business and now it's a it's a whole different thing. It's like uh, the, the the multiples are eight, sixteen, twenty four. We have some that are forty eight house farms farms. And now each of these houses is sixty six feet wide and six hundred feet long. So you're talking about forty eight houses. That's that's forty acres of chickens in 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 one pop. So uh, that that's changed um, the, the the number of farms. And we we're, we're pulling together some data right now. And um, and then it, and, and it tells a story. It shows a lot of like decline in the number of farms, but the increase in the inventory. So the farms are getting fewer, but they're getting bigger, just like the integrators are getting fewer and getting bigger. So the consolidation is even happening at the farm level also. Yeah, great. What's what's next, Mark? Great. We have some uh, comment in here from Dana and a question. Big thanks to Craig. It seems like most of us advocates. Most of us advocates on the animal welfare issue, the industry narrative has been very effective in smearing people who care about animals treatment as silly, snowflakey, whacktivists to be ignored. Any tips for talking specifically about humane treatment? Is that for me? I think it was you, Craig, go ahead. Oh my, I mean, um, as, as far as you, you can, you can have, you can, you can have industrial animal production or you can have good animal welfare. You can't have both. That system is designed to for those birds to grow abnormally fast as quick as they can, just barely stay alive long enough to get to market. This is not this is not about quality of life. This is about homogenizing widgets. So any any anything that that, that I mean I don't I don't see how um, I always say you can't defend a position there's no defense for. I, I don't see how this how these integrators even even mention the word animal welfare and then their industrial system in the same uh, breath and 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 actually people to take it seriously, right? Um, there, there's you know we 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 talk all the time about fighting industry narratives and they're um, you know they they they've done a good job at. Um, uh, this kind of Svengali kind of uh, labeling system where they uh, portray things as they certainly are not. So um, I, I I just think, uh, you know, you, you can you can Google a lot of, uh, you know, go to like the uh, ASPCA has got a good site, the, the shop with the heart. There, there, there'd be some good combat, combat uh, con uh, stuff to contradict industry narrative with that, certainly. And just look at the farms that are doing it right. 
and uh, you know, and, and pull from that. And and certainly, you it won't be anything uh, relative to what the uh, industry is doing. I don't know if that's the question or not. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I think it was a lot of helpful things there, Craig. The other thing I think I would only add to that, the, what Craig said, is that um, the, there's it's an important point to, that we don't have to um, stray away from the cruelty of the system o overall. That that saying that we want higher welfare. Um, systems for animals doesn't necessarily mean that you mean, you know, the most extreme sort of agenda, agenda um, perspective. And that, um, I, and I actually was just involved in some significant national polling that tells us that the, about 65% of Americans are, are actually in agreement with us on that. So while the industry certainly tries to paint that as a narrative, that, that uh, is, um, not not you know that and that that's sort of the and the truth of the matter is is that in that same polling that i'm talking about um something like 68 percent of people who are involved in agriculture think that those are inhumane practices so uh just so you know that you know i think don't don't shy away from don't shy away from the idea are pretty extreme operations what's next mark Great. There's a, a question in here, maybe something for Emily here. Is there a way to find out if a farmer is under a contract to a big corporation? Oh, um, that might be a better question for Craig. I would think that would be pretty hard to uncover. It's not like something that you could submit a federal records request for. Um, yeah, I, I I'm kind of coming up empty with that question. Are, are, I'm I'm curious. Are you talking about like can you get on the internet and search and see if a farmer's under a contract? I, I'm not I'm not sure I followed the question 100. percent But she's right. It's absolutely. But it, well, with in, in in North Carolina, it's weird. Poultry, the dry litter CAFO system, they don't they're not required to have any sort of operating permits. And and uh, until here recently, they didn't even have to have a construction stormwater permit. So the 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 DEQ has no idea what all these facilities are. Now the 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 Swine's a little different and the layers are a little different. They have a wet litter system, so they do have permits. So you could painstakingly probably do it one at a time. And but I I, I don't think there's no uh, quick answer there by any means. Yeah, and and I wonder. I'm not sure whether those permits would require the farmer to disclose any like affiliation with a corporate integrator. You could you could do it really painstakingly. You could drive all over the country, and if there's a lane sign at the end of that farm that says this farmer is a Purdue farmer, then you would know that. But uh, other than that, I really don't know. Yeah, I think those are all the right answer. It's very difficult to know exactly uh, um, who, who uh, what their private relationship is. Great. Maybe time for one more here as we get into this. And someone, uh, Jeff on here just mentioned, um, could you please comment on sort of the methodical or political erosion of low political erosion? Jake, you might be quick this one. Hey, that's a deep, that's back, a deep. It goes back to uh, the farm laws. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, that that's a deep question. Um, so so I think that the, per partic the per particularly the political, of local control really originates with, to, to Craig's point, a, a series of laws that that started in the early 2000s, sort of mid 2000s, what, what most people call right to farm um, laws. Many of those laws were um, drafted by the, drafted by the industry think tanks and then really made their way through sort of farm state legislatures in 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 a lot of places. Um, there, you know, there's some versions oftentimes of right to farm laws that go back to farm laws that go back to the seven were updated or modified to sort of um, strip the sort of local control that, that a lot of states had within their constitutions related to agriculture issues. Those issues were actually also placed on the ballot in in some states. So in in my home state of Missouri here, uh, in 2014, we had a, a right to farm alarm law that passed barely through an initiative where um, I was active in the no campaign. And then in 2016, I was involved 
uh, in work that that defeated right to farm legislation in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and the they the the ballot work they the the ballot work tend after that, but obviously industry was very active at at pursuing that erosion through, through state legislators and and other places, and and so we also have this, and Emily can speak more to this question, but we also have this issue of like pre what what is federal preemption? So right now there's an effort, for example, to preempt. Um, uh, California's law that was passed around animal welfare, Proposition 12, at the federal level um, through, through the Farm Bill, and but that preemption exists um, on the the federal level frequently for lots of we for lots of laws, sort of better potentially at the local level. So I don't know if there's anything in what you would add there on the the preemption issue, but. Um, not on that specifically, but something that came to mind as you were talking was also that there are plenty of state legislatures that legislatures are passing that. laws saying that the state regulators can't impose stricter environmental standards than the federal government does. That. So another mechanism, I guess, to hamstring attempts to yeah at oversight of the industry um, and another reason why um, improvements and reform at the federal level are really important and will have a trickle down effect um, in a lot of different states. And, and Jake, the, the right to farm laws weren't such a bad idea in, in you know, in, in concept. I mean, it's to protect the farmer against urban sprawl, but now the industry has used it as cover to, you know, get immune themselves from any accountability when they go plop down in the middle of, of, of another. It should be the who was there first law, right? Yeah, yeah, right. We we often have uh, right to farm laws being used. Right to farm laws being used. It's okay to move an industrial operation into right next door to a century farm that had been there for hundreds of you know for hundred plus years, uh, and and exactly right to sort of distort that concept. And and it, so, but right to farm is a catchy phrase. Farm is a catchy phrase and easy to put legislation. And just shout out to Starla and the Oregon campaign for, you know, in this like atmosphere of loss of local control, winning local control back in terms of their ability to impose setbacks uh, at the county level. So great job. Yeah. And Starla, I, I mean, I just invite you to say a couple of words about the the um, we talked about the political, but just the uh, the connection that people have in your community to the idea of local control, the popularity of local control in, in your community? Well, we're a bunch of independent minded people. We wear a lot of flannel shirts and well, jeans and nobody tells us what to do. So that part is good, but we also are ignorant of the workings of the government. And that's why all the help we got was so vital. Like I didn't even know what the House and the Senate meant or how to pass a bill, but definitely standing up for our our neighborhoods and our communities, 100%, man, we were doing it. And we also had little reward systems. I'd go, some of these loggers and farmers get together every Friday, they'd invite me in and encourage me and every time we won anything we'd have a celebration because we had to keep pumping ourselves up for the fight so yeah right mark do we have time for one more or should we be wrapping up my lost mark i think we have time for one more Great. Well, maybe I'll just ask as we're we're kind of preparing to to close out here, guys. Is um, we've been talking a lot about the the opportunity for folks to work within their communities, work at the state level, work at the federal level in collaboration. Uh, I wonder if you all could give us just one example example of something that your collaboration, a a coalition, something on the horizon that each of you are sort of uh, excited about or you know hopeful for in in the next you know coming little bit, whether it's next six months or a year or a couple of years, uh, things that you think will be sort of powerful. Um, Co collaborative opportunities come, come going forward. Maybe we'll start with uh, let's start with Starla on that. 
I'm not quite sure I understood your whole question, but you're you're talking about collaborative opportunities. Is what what are you excited about? What what collaborative opportunities are you excited now? That collaborative opportunities are you excited now that you've you, you guys have won some victories? What are you excited about next? Going down to the creek and it's still clean. Number one, and um, I watch being here for these two days i would be really excited if there could be one central page where we could collaborate with all of y'all and have times where we could speak and share our ideas and our experiences we've got some long-term researching people and people who have really great ideas that need to be tapped into everybody and i'm, I'm speaking nationally that's what i'd say yeah great yeah, great. Thank you. Maybe you want to share what you're excited about. Who's that? Let's have Emily go next and I'll let you go last, Craig. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'm excited to continue working with the kind of clean water coalition we've formed around the federal work um, and also in the Packers and Stockyard Act context, because I think those are very much still live. <laughs> but I think in addition to that, uh one area that is already has a really robust coalition working on it but will kind of con need continued uh action is around factory farm gas um this effort to monetize the factory farm waste stream and create this renewable natural gas from CAFO manure and sell it off for money so just further entrenching the kind of dirty system um with monetary incentives. So yeah, Food and Water Watch does a lot of work on that front and I know SRAP does as well and others. So excited to continue working in that space too. Great, and Craig, what are you excited about for the future? Oh my gosh, I, you know, uh, the momentum we, we, we've gained, I would say over the last 10 years, I, I picture this snowball going, going down here, you know, when it goes down here, it keeps picking up and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what I think our momentum is doing is we're getting more folks to collaborate with us on these issues and to, uh, you know, hold this industry accountable, number one, and move the needle to a more a better food system, number two. I mean, there's just uh, not, nothing but, but upside from here on out. Yeah, great. I think that's right. And I think I'll, I'll just wrap up with the fact that um, what I have, you know, as, as someone who's been working in this space for, you know, a couple of decades now, not to date myself, but, but to, uh, say that, you know, the, you know, the, I think moving forward is things like this, that the sort of general recognition that we all need to be working together more collaboratively and that, you know, if you look back over, you look back over the list of been um, involved in, engaged in this summit, um, if you look at the list of folks, as I was browsing earlier, who uh, many names pop up, who I'm familiar with on the, the folks listening in and attending is attending is that that we need to be, um, you know, we've needed for years to be sort of aggregating, sort of aggregating power of, of the people to really combat this significant industry that we're up against. And uh, in a lot of ways, we're maybe the most organized uh, we have ever been, in my opinion. And, and that, and that this is paying dividends. It's paid pay dividends in, in Oregon, where um, Starla's community was, was, you know, his water is still clean. It's paid dividends uh, with the Packers and Stockyards work that, that so many of us have been involved in. Uh, it needs to continue to pay dividends in the, the EPA process that's been outlined that, that Emily was uh, chatting about. It's paid dividends in political terms with our uh, political candidates. Um, and and we just need to continue as a, as a movement to aggregate our power and power and and to make sure we're brawls between our individual interests, whether we come from animal welfare backgrounds or environmental backgrounds, or farming backgrounds or or health backgrounds. Those walls that 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 sort of have divided us have sort of advantaged the industry historically. And we're we're all doing a much better job um, recently 
in in making sure that we're working together and, and collaborating. So I was excited to moderate this uh, great panel, and I want to just thank the um, the panelists again for all your work and all your expertise in this space. Uh, and I want to thank SRAP for being such a great SRAP for being such a great collaborative go through um, th this this time where we are making progress, but there's still a lot of uh, fight ahead of us. So so I'm eager and excited to see what all of you do and and what we can all do together uh, together um, over the next. Couple. That is going to be uh, an important piece of of SRAP's work, and and I'm just glad to be in the fight with you all. So. Thanks so much for uh, this session, and I know we're getting close to, to the end, and, but I, I hope you all will stick around for uh, our keynote because I know Austin's going to do a, a wonderful job, and, and I'm excited to hear his his to hear his his conversation. And you all should go read his book when you can.